Hey everyone, welcome to the Couch GM podcast. You can find the full video version of this podcast on YouTube, or you can listen to the audio version on whichever major podcast platform you prefer. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you can also find me on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook. Just search the Couch GM and you'll see my logo pop up. And with that, let's get into the podcast. All right, welcome to the Couch GM podcast. Today we're joined by Will Ortner, who's a friend of mine and a regular on uh Portland's 1080 The Fan, which is a sports radio show. And today we're going to be talking all things all-star break. We're going to get into the Home Run Derby, MLB Draft, and then do a little preview on the second half of the MLB season. But 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 before we do so, um, Will, if you want to take a moment and introduce yourself, kind of explain how you got to where you are today, what you do, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for having me on, Connor. I uh, really appreciate it. Excited to uh, be a part of this. Uh, program. Um, so uh, my background is actually a lot of football. Um, grew up playing that. Of course, grew up playing baseball, grew up uh, playing basketball. Football has been my area of expertise, but I mean, like, as you can see, I've got my, my old Largent little shirt on, little jersey. I'm a big fan of uh, anything Pacific Northwest. Um, so Seahawks, Mariners, Blazers, uh, got my Kraken hat on too. Um, those, that's kind of where I reside, been a fan you know, my entire life, uh, I was able to get in over at 1080 because I got to play a little college football and uh, give my expertise there. And then as I've been able to do that, I've been able to work on uh, some different basketball shows, um, some different daily shows, and of course, our uh, weekly baseball show um, and give my opinion on uh, our Seattle Mariners. So yeah. uh, definitely excited to be here and uh, talk a little bit about the M's. And uh, look, you know, I, I'm pretty optimistic. Um, as a, as a Seattle sports fan, you kind of have to be because other than in 2014, 2015, you know, uh, for the Seahawks, it hasn't been a bed of roses, uh, in our sports landscape. So I'm always looking at it glass half full. Yeah. You kind of have to, it never goes quite how you expected it to go. And I mean, yeah, look just real quick on the Mariners roster, looking at the yeah opening day, you know, I was excited for the, for the lineup, maybe one or two about short, but then just basically the entire roster underperforming from the get-go aside from Jared Kelnick. Um, it's been a disappointment, uh, but I mean, they are seven and three, their last 10 heading into the break. And we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, there's also some other teams that have done not so well heading into the break, which sets things up pretty nicely for the second half. Um, yeah. But, but first, yeah, but first off, so uh, all-star weekend or the all-star week, um, were you able to watch some of the, the festivities? Oh, yeah. In the studio, we had the Home Run Derby going. Um, we'll have oh, nice. won some money off of Julio, so that, I appreciate him for that. Wasn't able to get me the full win, but um, I, I, I don't know if Seattle could have had a better All-Star weekend, not just as a team, but as a city. I mean, beautiful weather. The amenities were top-notch. The beauty of having Lumen Field right there is you've yeah. got the MLB draft right next to T-Mobile. The fans were out in droves. Everything was sold out. The fans were loud. They were cheering. They booed when they should have booed. Shout out the Astros. They were cheering yeah. when they should have cheered. They're trying to get Shohei to come to Seattle. I loved it. It was – I don't think it could have went better. I really don't. I think that was the perfect weekend that Seattle could have had. Absolutely. And, yeah, I also heard a rumor that, you know, Ichiro wasn't at the All-Star game. And Weird. I heard a rumor that it might have been because he wanted to keep the attention, the Japanese media, off of him and keep it on Shohei. So oh. it could just be a conspiracy or it could be some reality to that. Um, and kind of showing that Shohei, like, hey, this, this city could be yours. You know, it's not all Ichiro. Hey, well, and from what he's saying, he's stayed in Seattle before. He spent a lot of time That's there me. in the off season. See, and that I don't think it surprises me because, like, when you think of Japanese baseball players coming to the MLB, maybe that's just because we're from here. But I mean, you've got Kenji Jojima, Ichiro, um, and, and I know I'm I'm missing some, but there was that closer back in the day, uh, in the early two thousands. So when I think of players coming over, where do you think they come to Seattle? It seems like the easiest place. Plus, it also seems like a place where. He's not really going to have to worry about being bombarded. He talks all the time about he doesn't like to go back to Japan all the time because he's too much of a celebrity. I wish I had that <laughs> issue, right? But yeah, right. 
it, it's it's the perfect spot for him because he's going to get the love and maybe some of the attention that he wants, but not all of it. So I thought that was pretty cool. I didn't hear that about Ichiro, though. I was like, that's so weird that he wouldn't be there. Yeah, but exactly. Maybe it's... Because, I mean, it's, yeah, the first, you know, All-Star game in Seattle since 2001. All the, the big names, Edgar, Jay Buhner, Ken Griffey, all those guys were in town. But Ichiro's obviously been a huge part of the franchise, and there, there's got to be a reason behind that. I hope it's that reason. <laughs> hey, you know what? Maybe maybe he truly needs that uh, that off time that he said he wanted, right? Maybe that's that's his plan there. But um, I, definitely, he was missed. Yeah. Um, and then jerseys. What what are your opinion on the jerseys for the All Star Game? I'm old school. Like I get it. It's Mariner colors, right? For both teams, there's something nostalgic about everyone playing in your own jersey, right? I know what the MLB is doing. The jerseys are there to sell. I think sure. I looked at I looked it up yesterday. It's like a normal Julio jersey goes for like 120, 110, 115 somewhere in there. When I looked up the All-Star Julio jersey, it was like 200 bucks. So of it's course. like you're doing this to get a bunch of money. I get it. Smart smart businessmen, there's a reason why you are running, you know, the MLB or you're doing marketing for the ball clubs. Totally get that. But I think what you could do is, like, have every player out there in their jersey and then have, like, a little bit of a patch or have something that signifies, like, hey, this is an all-star jersey. Because there were so many different players where, yeah, I focus on my Mariners, but if you're in the National League, you're a team, you're a guy that plays for a team that I'm not going to see all the time, I'm not going to recognize it. Like, uh, who's my guy who won the MVP, the Rockies catcher, Elias something? Um, Uh, Elias Diaz? Thank you. Elias Diaz. He wins. I know he's like a, a feel good story. He's 32 years old. First all-star game guy hits a home run, huge deal. But during the game, I was like, who is that guy? I don't remember hearing about him. Who does he play for? I think there needs to be more of an onus on, Hey, this is who this guy plays for. This is who this person is because then you can get that national feel that national care instead of where baseball has had this issue of like, we're just super regional. Like I know my Mariners, but if you're not in the AL West or you're not, you know, at Boston or in New York, I might struggle to know who you are exactly. Do do something so that it's like, Hey, that's a Rocky. That's this guy. That's that yeah. guy. for sure. And then, um, so yeah, the uh, national league won for the first time in something like 10 years, they ended the, uh, the second longest drought in all-star game history. Um, and now the uh, in the past, I believe it was the World Series home field advantage was determined based off the All Star Game, but that's no longer yeah. the case, which I, I think is a good move. Um, a couple yeah, other so notes. I, from the, yeah, I go for it. No, you're good. I I agree. I, I couldn't agree more. I do like though that with the MLB All Star Game, it still kind of feels like they care. You know what I mean? Like when oh, you yeah. watch the Pro Bowl, they don't care. They're just there to collect the check, get the extra, you know, ding. Um, They're just hucking get the, the ball patch. There. Yeah. Exactly. They don't care. When you look at the NBA, guys are messing around. No one's going up to play any defense, anything like that. Look at the first inning. You got two guys diving into the wall yeah. in off the first two batters. Right. That's fantastic. And there's a reason why they win in the TV rain, rankings when it comes to all-star games. Like, I get it. It's, you know, middle of summer. What else are you going to watch? You going to turn on Netflix? No, you're going to watch this. But at the same time, you actually have players that care. I love that. It's going to get me to tune in every year. Absolutely. And also the the mic'd up stuff is amazing. Dude, fantastic. Especially the pitchers being mic'd up and the hitter. <laughs> Dude, hater like okay, yeah, I'm yeah, no, that's a funny joke. Hit this here. Hold on. Let me pitch this fastball. Boom. Or he's like, Back "What should I talking. throw here?" Yeah. Exactly. That's that's fantastic. And that's a great way to do it. Cause you're not going to be able to do that in a real game, but in the all-star game, it works perfect. And also one other note on uh, the, the changes with the all-star game. Now, if it ends in a tie, instead of going to extra innings, it would be a home run derby to determine the winner. I really hope perfect. that it would, that it was going to finish in a tie, but uh, we were close. I, well, I wanted the AL to win, but that's cause I had money. Yeah. In the AL. But, I just wanted to know, see a slug fest again. Yeah. <laughs> dude, that'd have been awesome. Uh, I know this is a little side note. Can we go back to the old school 10 outs? Like, it, yeah, I was going to bring that it. up actually. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. 
I want I want old school ten outs because after the home run derby on uh, what was that Monday, uh, yeah. I went back and I watched Josh Hamilton's, and there is something so cool about every single ball that he hit. It was like you get to watch it all the way up, all the way <laughs> down, and then you're like, how far did it go? And it's like five hundred, and then it's like next pitch gets thrown. I right. get that you had to do something to speed it up so that it wasn't this like four hour thing because guys were taking pitches, but maybe make it like five outs instead of 10 or, you know, maybe you can only take three pitches. So that way it's still sped up because right now it's just like, who has the most endurance? I think if it's the old school way and, you know, Julio would have been one of the last guys to go, Julio would have known like, all right, I got my 25, 30, I can call it here because he was so clearly gassed by the end yeah. of that second round that he couldn't keep up with Vladdy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just the tension of when you have, you know, nine outs and there's that gold ball mm -hmm. being tossed. Right. And it goes, it's always like a charity ball. It goes like, can't stand up to cancer or right. something. Like that's fantastic. And the thing is with this Derby, you know, balls are being, being hit so quickly. A lot of people didn't even realize that a kid got hit in the face with a, a line drive by Vlad <laughs> Jr. That was like 115.8 off the bat. It's like yeah. no one even noticed. Like it just nails him. Camera goes to the batter again. He hits another ball. It's That's so dangerous. Well, it's crazy. Like I know that's what I wanted to do when I was a kid. And I'm sure you wanted to do the same thing. But I, we got to put college kids out there, right? Like go get some <laughs> Seattle U guys. Go get some UW kids and throw throw them out there. We need like 18 and up. This isn't mutton busting. You can't have a 12 year old out there. I mean, it's hard enough for, I mean, you know, big leaguers to read a ball, um, especially, yeah, as you mentioned, like college, high school, but to throw like an eight year old out there, here's a glove, go shag against the guys with the top exit <laughs> velocity in the league. That's just, that's such a huge liability. <laughs> no, it's just asking people to get hurt. I also think it would be funny too, because like, I am laughing. I probably shouldn't be because it's not funny that an eight year old got hit. But no. if it's like 18 to 21 year old, that's pretty funny. And that's kind of <laughs> hilarious. So then I, I think it makes it okay. Cause you're going to laugh. People laugh when people get hurt. There's a whole Instagram page where it's <laughs> literally titled people getting hurt and everyone <laughs> follows it. But like, let's make it like 18 to 22 year olds. And it's then like you can understand can what laugh. you're signing up for and putting yeah. the risk that you're putting yourself in. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would be fantastic. Maybe even they have a few beverages before. That would make it awesome. <laughs> <laughs> For better or worse, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then also with the Derby, Adley Rutschman starting on the left side, and then, you know, he takes his time out, or was it the extra time? And then he He's switches extra. to the right side. Mm-hmm. He matched every – he was like seven for eight or eight for nine, something like that. That was fantastic. Another one where – we got absolutely hosed. He had the third or fourth most home runs in the first round, but he's out because he went up against one of the other guys who had a yeah, higher he went home against run Luis total. Robert. Yeah. Yeah. Like, dude, just just do top four or you know, do some kind of round robin thing. Don't don't do it in this bracket style play because I think there's a chance after the way Adley was hitting he could have won the whole thing. I don't think he gassed himself out and he can go from both sides. Like, yeah. Hey, to get okay, tired. Of, yeah. Exactly. I'm tired on righty. I'm going to go lefty. I'm tired lefty. I'm going to go righty. I would have liked to see Adley continue on and continue to uh, try and hit more home runs. I think they dropped the ball on that one because he's one of the fresh young faces and he's a Pacific Northwest kid. They needed to have him go further on. For sure. And, uh, see, you know, seeing him in the Derby made me think of other switch hitters in the league. That would be cool to see. Um, of course, from the, from the Mariners, switch hitting catcher, Cal Raleigh. We'll see if he mm -hmm. hits enough bombs to be in the Derby at some point. Of course, he's stronger from the left side. But um, And then also, Ellie De La Cruz. You know, you, you'd imagine Ooh. that he'll be in the Homer Derby at some point, probably next year even, because he's going to be, would, you know, there's Julio that face baseball. Ellie's going to be right up there. Oh, I would think so. I this is going to be mean. I think Julio's prettier. And so Julio <laughs> will always be the face. Ellie is the most electric player right now. I yeah. don't think that there is anyone more electric. Like if I have to buy a ticket and you say, Hey, it's Shohei, it's Julio, it's Ellie. I'm probably buying the Shohei ticket. Cause I'm like, I can see it. Him, 
pitch and hit in the same game. But what game I'm most excited to go to, I think it's Ellie. Like, I want to go see Ellie De La Cruz. He might be the most exciting guy to watch out strike out four times right now in baseball. Right? <laughs> like, there are guys where you go, you used to go and watch him back in the day. Like, I went to a Barry Bonds game when I was super young, and he was kind of at the tail end of his career. He struck out three times and walked one. Every single time I was at the edge of my seat. I was <laughs> jacked to see what Barry Bonds was going to do. I think Ellie De La Cruz – has reached that pinnacle of like every time he's up to bat, I'm excited. And if he gets on base, it's just extra because I know he's going to try and steal within the first two or three pitches. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the guy's, you know, setting the top sprint speeds. He's hitting some of the hardest balls that you've seen um, from both sides of the plate. Also, it's just ridiculous. He, the talent that some still, of these guys have. He's still first, second, yeah, yeah. third, and home, and home. <laughs> two pitches, two pitches. Yeah, I, I I don't know what the stat was, but he's the first to do it since, you know, in a long time, obviously, because that mm-hmm. never happens. Dude, but, he's awesome. So electric. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then Corbin Carroll, he made his uh first all star all star game. He uh he played high school baseball just eleven miles away from uh T Mobile Park. So that's really cool to see that. Yeah, crazy. He was also uh local size, Hillsborough Hop. He what? Sorry, I believe he was a he was a hop. I believe. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, he was for sure. Yeah, the Diamondbacks he, he, single A is uh, the hops. So yeah, he was he was yeah. there. Yeah, that's so, where he hit his first uh, home run. Wow! So he he, he ends up hitting a, he ends up hitting a couple local areas. Plus, I mean, he's up there he's up there in the conversation for NL Rookie of the Year and NL MVP. Probably not the MVP, and I mean. I think Ellie's mid, like he he waited too long to get called up. Not he, but the Reds waited too long to call him up. Yeah. I think Carroll will still edge him out in that uh, rookie of the year deal in the NL. But I mean, shoot, the guy is he's quietly putting together one of the best seasons in all of baseball. Yeah, and I don't know if you saw it was the week of the this last week. Um, so backing up in t- in 2021, he had a swing mm-hmm. and he uh, tore a bunch of stuff in his shoulder. He ended up getting surgery mm. and then he ended up making his debut at some point down the road. But uh, last week he w- he was taken out of like two games because in separate swings, he was kind of coming up the same way that he did when he injured it the first time. So mm-hmm. hopefully that's not a, a lingering thing, but yeah, go, go get that. Go do something to fix that. Go get with a swing coach to where you're not swinging that way. Do something. He had switched yeah, to, to uh, like, you know, it happened because he was releasing with one arm and then he switched mm. to two hands on the follow through. So maybe mm. some change like that would help, but it's easier said than done. I wonder if it's like a, if it's like a labrum thing, like he, like he tore his labrum as a young kid. And so now there's like some overcompensation for it or different things you gotta do. I'd be interested yeah. to know a little bit more about that. Yeah. And then, um, Louisa rise, uh, the batting average king in the National League. He got two hits on two pitches and two at bats in the All Star game. I mean, what else do you expect? I guess. Dude, he's fantastic. I just hate that one of them was against Kirby. Yeah, right. Kirby was pumping ninety nine. Dude, still, still caught up. That's the other thing. Like, I know they, I know why the like the American League didn't throw Castillo, but I mean, come on, just give him like one or two batters, right? Like, let all the Mariners pitch in t-mobile they've earned it it's their all-star game it was nice to see kirby go out there i'm just bummed for him personally because it's like he's gonna have a lot more all-star games this is just the first of many but it's like man if he could have went out there had you know three strikeouts given up no runs that place would have been rocking for him yeah for sure and then um there was six rangers that were starting in the all-star game which was a pain to see um josh josh young he leads rookies in home runs and rbis um yeah so the rangers team has come out of nowhere and they've produced six all-stars this year which is pretty nuts well, they, get, they got uh the older guys that are healthy Simeon and uh seager um i know seager missed a little time at the beginning but i mean look you paid for those guys to perform and unlike the Mets stars that they paid for players to perform, your guys are actually coming out and performing. Um, I did appreciate though, like 
the Mariners uh, fan shop didn't sell or didn't have them up front, the Texas Ranger all-star jerseys. I appreciated that little jab. And then I appreciated the T-Mobile faithful booing the Astros. Like, what a great sports town. Yeah, it's the American League, and you want to win, but you're not going to let those cheaters get away with it. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And especially because, you know, they didn't really get away with they, – or they basically got away with the cheating thing. They didn't really get mm-hmm. punished at all. So now – as long as they're playing in the league, all these guys that were on that team are going to get that same treatment, which is awesome. Yeah, it's, dude, you deserve it. I mean, hey, look, it was probably worth it in their eyes. You got two titles out of it. I get that. You ain't cheating. You ain't trying. But at the <laughs> same time, like, you got to you gotta get properly reprimanded. That's all. I'm yeah. Saying. Yeah. And then you, you saw, of course, that Manfred was also booed during the, uh, the Astros pick during the MLB draft. That was fantastic. Dude. He deserved because you're booing the Astros and Manfred, which is fantastic. Then he goes all Dean Warmer on everybody, and he he looks so, all pouting, he looks so upset. Yeah, pouting. And it's like, dude, this is part of the process. Like, you get booed as the commissioner. It's the rival team in the rival city that got away with murder when they cheated, and you let them do it. <laughs> Of course you're getting booed. You deserve all of it. And it's fantastic that it actually got under his skin. He needs to take a, a playbook out of Roger Goodell where he just kind of like, eh, whatever, who cares? Or I don't know. Was it David Cern or was it Bettman who was like, come on, let me hear it. I can't hear <laughs> Embrace you. It. Like just, yes, go full WWE heel. Go Vince McMahon. Do <laughs> something go. crazy. Start making up, you know, not real rules, but fake rules or different stuff like that. Own it. Own it. Don't get mad because fans are having fun. It seems like all of his public facing, you know, moments are just a negative impact on his, um, because, you know, he called the uh, the World Series tra- uh, trophy a, a piece of metal the other year. Yeah, that went awful. Mm-hmm. This whole Astros thing, just like every public thing that he does, is just never good. It's bad. The lies to get the A's to Vegas, saying that Oakland didn't even work with them, and it's like yeah they did there's paperwork right here it might not have been the deal that you wanted but they were he is quickly and i mean quickly jumping up the ranks of most hated commissioner i don't think he's quite to betman status yet but he is i bet he's past roger goodell and he is right on the heels sure. of gary Bettman. yeah and um i also saw well yeah uh kind of going back during the a's thing you know when they did the reverse the reverse boycott, he made a statement saying like, hey, nice job, A's fans. Like you almost made it to an average MLB game attendance type thing, taking a jab at the fans as if, as if they had something to do with the team moving. Yeah, see, um, dude, go full WWE heel. Like he should come out. I don't even, like he should come out to like Hell's Bells or something. Have some <laughs> bad evil villain song, Bad Boys for Life. Come out to something crazy. Shave your head. Look like Lex Luthor. It'd be fantastic. Totally, totally lean into this, Manfred. And then I saw, I think on Twitter, that he, he either tweeted or made a statement saying, you know, he's trying to make his run for being reelected as commissioner. I'm not exactly sure when his role is up, um, but I saw something came out this week where he was like, hey, like, I want, I still, I have the best job in the world. You know, I, I still want to be commissioner type thing. It's like, ah. Uh, I think your time's up. Yeah, I. But here's the thing: if the owners are happy, he'll stay. The minute he pisses off the owners, it's when he'll be gone. And I and I think the owners are actually going to be pretty happy with everything that he's put in. That's why he'll stay. I mean, Roger Goodell has, uh, as a football guy, he's really hamstrung a lot of defenses. Right? He's made it super offensive focused. The. The owners don't care because he's making them more money every single day because people want to tune in and watch this new brand of football that's not as physical as it used to be. Some of the rules are good, and I agree with them. Some of them I disagree with, and I think a lot of fans disagree, but it's bringing more money back into owners' pockets. If Manfred can do the same thing, I mean, he'll stay there forever, which yeah, there's some good to it. There's some bad to it. And with these new rules, that's for sure helping, you know, attendance and viewership. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then you got a team now in Vegas. All the owners are going to want to travel to those away games. There's going to be an expansion um, coming after the A's are officially moved. Yep. You're going to get two new ball clubs in, which 
I'm sure it's similar to the NBA and NFL where they actually have to pay all the teams. Then they get their, their uh, new ball club. So I, I, I think he's going to be more well-liked. This might be one of those where he has to go through like the song and dance, but he's really running unopposed. Yeah, for sure. Um, now getting into the MLB draft. Um, that, that was really entertaining. I mean, I don't know if you, you've, heard much about the draft but um scott hunter who's the director of amateur scouting for the mariners um he had a media availability this last weekend that i was up in seattle Mm -hmm. that was really cool because he was talking about how deep this mlb draft was in particular and Mm -hmm. because for multiple reasons one is because COVID happened so the mlb draft back then was reduced to five rounds less people getting drafted those you know high schoolers that might have been drafted if they had their senior year or if the the draft was longer those people basically were in this draft, like the Paul Skeen, mm-hmm. the Dylan Cruz types, um, because you have to wait until after your junior year if you're at a four-year university until you become eligible. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's all those guys on top of hearing him talk about how more mature and advanced the high school players are nowadays because of the science and technology that's come out. Pitchers are throwing harder with better spin stuff which makes the hitters better because they're already seeing that, that stuff. So mm-hmm. it's this culmination of these, all these different factors. And then you have the Mariners with three picks in the top 30. So um, yeah, it was a really exciting day. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm excited. Colt Emerson sounds like a solid baseball player name. So just on that alone, <laughs> I'm already like, yeah, let's Jocking go. For the names. Colt. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> look, if your name is Colt Emerson, that sounds like a baseball player. If his name was like Steve Williams, it'd be like, oh, I don't know what's <laughs> going on there. But uh, no, I'm, I'm excited to uh, see what he can do. And I'm excited really to see what a lot of these these uh, baseball players can do. Because like, I've, I've been able to see Paul Skeens and Dylan Cruz because I watched the College World Series. Um, I think a lot of baseball fans do and should. Um, but a lot of times with those guys uh, and with the high school kids, it's it's either a lack of getting to see them all the time or not understanding how the numbers translate. Like when I watch a college football game, if I see a quarterback through for, you know, 5,000 yards in one season, uh, had 70% completion percentage, 40 touchdowns, 10 interceptions, I in my head go, that's probably going to be a pretty good prospect. When you look at baseball, because the games are so much fewer, it's like he hit 490 and (laughs) he's got like 14 home runs. Like, that seems like pretty good numbers, but how does that translate? How does this go here? If you're a pitcher, that's awesome. You're throwing in the hundreds, but is it because you're going up against, you know, lesser competition that you have a higher strikeout per number or higher strikeout percentage? How does this all work? So with a lot of these guys, you really have to trust the eye test. And then you have to trust guys like you or, um, you know, different scouts, what different people are saying about the draft and the players, and then hope that in two to three years, you get to see them really come up and pay off now a guy like Cruz and schemes those guys you might see them at the end of this year or you know next year but for the young guys like Colt Emerson like uh Noble Meyer when do you see them do they get up at 20 do they get up at 21 22 you know how how are these guys going to develop and what to look for you really have to trust the experts right um but it, it's it's exciting and it, it felt like it was the first time where I paid attention to an MLB draft because most of the time it's like, man, I'll see the guy in three years if he's good. Right, right. This one was like, hey, I want to see this. And then let's go on YouTube. Noble Myers highlight tape. Colt Emerson, what do you look like? And then you can get excited, which is the one thing that the MLB was missing compared to the NBA and the NFL draft. Yeah, and as you're speaking to, yeah, in the NFL, the NBA, you get drafted, you're making an impact that year. So – that's why everyone's watching that is because it's like, okay, this is the next face of the franchise right there mm-hmm. versus the MLB draft. As you mentioned, of course, you know, three years down the road, they might, might make an impact on the team, but the vast majority of players don't ever make it to the MLB. So, yeah, I, I saw, and I, I wish I had it up in front of me right now, but I, I saw a list and it was like percentage of uh, draft picks that actually make it to the league. And I want to say the Dodgers were the top at like 20%. Which is so Jeez. crazy, because when yeah, you look sounds... at the, uh, it, yeah, right, and you look at the other sports, and it's like NFL, 
unless you're a seventh round draft pick, if you get drafted, you're at least with the team for a year, unless you really suck. Right. Yeah. In the NBA, the top guys, you know who they are and you know that they're going to at least get a shot to play. And you can watch summer league and preseason to have an idea, but MLB, you can hear a guy, you know, Hey, this guy got drafted. You're super excited about him. And then you don't see him for four or five years. You forget about him. And then it's like, Oh yeah, he didn't make it. Right. Like, or and he got he traded three times and he had injuries. Yeah. So for yeah. me with a lot of these guys, typically I listen to guys like you, I listen to scouts. Hey, this guy could be coming up in the next year. Sweet. Can't wait to see him. Uh, but this year it was like, Hey, let's actually pay attention. And now I'm waiting for Cole Emerson to get up on the, uh, on the Mariners might have to wait three or four years, but I'm waiting. Yeah. And uh, I really do wish that Paul Skeens and Max or uh, sorry, Dylan Cruz could come and make an impact this year. Cause they, they could compete, you know, Paul Skeens can come up here and strike guys out in the, in the show immediately, mm-hmm. but with the service time clocks, um, unfortunately, you know, the owners and the GMs are trying to maintain control for as long as possible. So they'll probably milk yeah. them out a year, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, getting into the Mariners draft. Um, I just kind of want to glaze over a majority of the draft picks real quick. Um, so first off, uh, Jerry Depoto was on the Seattle sports seven ten today, the Mike Salk show mm-hmm. talking about the draft a bit. And um, so the draft happened over Lumen field. That's where their team was. And apparently over the, you know, three weeks leading up to the draft, the, the room goes in, they go over s- about 700 players in, in their meeting wow. rooms over these three weeks. They're talking with area scouts, um, all these different guys that have been around the country watching these players in person and figuring out who they're going to take. Um, so I would, I would love to see something like hard knocks type thing to where it's showing in the draft room or leading up to the draft. That would just be so cool to see a docu-series or something like that. What, what but, would that look like? And then uh, like what it would look like if you followed them too, right? Like, what are you looking for? What makes you want to draft these plays players? where do you look at their comps? Cause they're so far away. Is it all just based on potential? Where does it factor in of like, Oh, he's already got this. I- I'm right there with you. I pay attention. The other sport leagues are really failing in that the NFL dominates the yeah. docu series following a team through the season. I mean, right now Netflix has quarterback where you're following three quarterbacks. Where's pitcher, right? right. Where, where is infielder? <laughs> Where's outfielder? I would love to follow some of these guys. And I, and I know maybe like the language barrier could be a thing that makes it hard in certain spots, but still like MLB, that's, that's the next step. And that's the next step to getting it national. That's a great idea. A hard knock style war room look. Yeah. So Colt Emerson was, as you mentioned, was taken uh, with the, the M's first pick at number 22 overall six one one ninety five. He's a left-handed shortstop slash third baseman. He's just 17 years old um, and, you know, kind of, as you mentioned, looking at numbers and trying to figure out what that actually means, you know, in high school, his senior year, he batted 455, 26 doubles, eight triples, 13 home runs, um, mm-hmm. a 587 on base percentage and a 928 slugging. So it's an OPS of 1.515, which is insane. He struck out just 14 times in his high school career while walking 43 times. And a lot of people were noting, and again, on the Mike Salk show that he's very similar to Cole Young, who the Mariners had taken last year in the, with their first pick, who's also a left-handed hitting shortstop. And um, I don't know if you follow Joe Doyle with prospects live, but he's basically the, the prospects guy for baseball. And he's yeah. saying that, you know, Colt Emerson is basically a clone of Cole Young, except with more power. Um, and so there's speculation whether, you know, if the Mariners are going to be making moves at the deadline, if Cole Young is now expendable because they got mm-hmm. potentially the same guy in this draft. So well, that'll be interesting that, to see. That's the other thing that I like can be interesting and difficult to talk about because like with every draft, you kind of have to draft each position because you don't know how guys are going to turn out. Like in the NFL, the Seahawks drafted a left tackle in Charles Cross two years ago, right? So they drafted him. 
it's clear that he's going to work out. So they don't really need to draft another left tackle, right. at least not one high up early on. Where in the MLB, it's almost like you have to draft guys based on what their potential is because you never know what's going to happen with a guy. Is a guy going to stay healthy? Or, and I mean, I know it's, it's a bigger freak thing than anything else, but you can move guys around. Like Bryce Harper was drafted as a catcher, plays in the outfield, he plays first base. Mookie Betts, I mean, he's shown his ability to play different positions. So it's like maybe you draft the shortstop, and then it's like, well, we've got two good shortstops. Let's make one a third baseman. Right. I'd be interested to know and like what goes into Depoto's thought process on that. Is everything based on I'm drafting not by position, by skill or potential, right. or am I drafting, hey, you know what, JP's contract comes up in two to three years. Let's get a, a young guy up there, and then we can make the decision, like, do we want to extend JP? Do we want to try out the young buck? Can we use the young buck to get better hitting, get better pitching? I, it's very fascinating. Yeah, and kind of listening to DePoto a bit, it sounds like, yeah, they're definitely drafting, you know, for the best player. Um, because um, I was speaking with Ryan Dibish last week, and he was saying you, you can never draft in baseball based on your current need. Because, like you mentioned, it's like you draft a third baseman, he's either not going to make it to the show or he might be a different position and, you know, all these different factors. So it's like you just have to get the highest upside guys, and that's what it sounds like the Mariners were trying to do with these three picks. And um, it sounds like it was the deepest, you know, draft in high school position players that the Mariners have seen, which is what Depoto said today. So mm -hmm. they went, yeah, full on with the uh, high school hitters. All of them were left-handed hitter hitters, which was interesting, but all of them are just pure athletes. They all have, um, you know, really high batting average on base percentage, which is great. They all have steals, you know, just all around athletes. So, um. Yeah, so having let's a see. lot of athletes yeah. isn't a bad thing. Having a lot For of sure. athletes is never a bad thing. And as you mentioned, you could just move them around. And uh, shortstops and center fielders are, you know, the best athletes um, on the field. So if you can just take shortstops because they're great athletes, then they translate to other spots too. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Jeff Passan, who's a ESPN guy, uh, big on baseball, he was talking about how Cole Young how much value he currently has and that if there was a redraft of last year's draft that Cole Young would be drafted top 10 this year. So that also kind of plays into, you know, his value is high. Um, so he might, you know, be one of those guys that could be used as a piece. Yeah. You use him to get hitting right now because right. he's, he's still going to be a year or two away and, I mean, like I said, I'm looking at a glass half full, but four games is not an insurmountable, you know, loss that you're behind right now. You can you can make up four. Shoot, you can make up six. Yeah, if you have the right pitching and the right hitting, you can do it. And it's not like it's the most difficult schedule of all time for the Mariners going to the postseason. So – I don't necessarily hate that either. Um, and it can show, I think it can show a lot of guys like last year, you made the trade, you got Castillo when you needed more pitching. He's now your ace and it helped propel your team to get into the playoffs and get that wild card spot that you did. Why couldn't you do the same thing with hitting? Yeah, you might have to give up a young kid, but sometimes that's the business. For sure. Yeah, and uh, speaking to the Mariners' strength of schedule, um, you should check out a website, tankathon.com. Mm -hmm. um, I'm well aware. I'm a player, okay, yeah. man. I know what Tankathon is. Yeah, so strength of schedule. Um, the Mariners have the 27th most difficult remaining strength of schedule, which is very good. Um, their hardest opponents are four games against the Rays. They got the Orioles for a couple, the Dodgers, Diamondbacks, Rangers, Astros. Um, so that puts them in a great spot. And then... You know, mm -hmm. they've been seven and three the past 10. If the the Rangers stay three and seven again for another 10 or the Angels one and nine for another 10 or anywhere around there, then, you know, the Mariners are near the top of the division pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at it. You won your last three series and you went from, I mean, the A's are dead, dead last, but you went from being behind the Angels 
Astros and the Rangers. And now all of a sudden you're at least within striking distance. You're at least within a spot where you can have the conversation or I can be glass half full and go, there's a shot. It's an outside shot. It's a tough shot, but it's there. If you can get bats hot, if you, if your pitching can stay the way it has been, maybe you add another bat or two, watch out. Why can't you make it? Why can't you find a way to get into the playoffs? And then from there, anything can happen. Look at the Phillies last year. They backed their way into the last NL spot, and they went all the way to the World Series. Just get into the dance. Get into right. the playoffs. Have a chip in a chair. Let's see what can happen. Absolutely. And uh, again, with the Angels, you know, Trout just broke his hammock bone in his hand. That's going to be four to six weeks. I've heard six to eight weeks potentially. Um, mm-hmm. Also, Rendon has been out for a period of time. So, I mean, do they trade Otani? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's something we could get into. Um, yeah, I'd love to get into that because I, here's my take on that. Don't. Because he's going to be a free agent next year. Whatever you're going to have to do to get Otani is going to be a reason why he won't sign with you next year. If that makes sense. Because you're going to have to give up a lot to get Otani. That's going to be the biggest haul in history. Exactly. It's in division against your rivals. And they, if they're going to trade him, they're going to make sure they get something back. Because every team in the MLB is going to want to try and trade for him. Well, he has made it clear he's tired of losing. He hates that. So if I'm the Mariners, I'm not trading anything for Otani. Because if you are, you're probably going to have to give up a couple bats, which you can't afford to lose right now. And you're going to have to give up a couple pitchers, which you are deep on pitchers. But that still means your your rotation is going to be weaker. And you're probably going to have to give up a player or two in the bullpen. So don't trade anybody now. And then throw him the most insane contract you possibly can. It's the MLB. It's no salary cap throw the half a billion you'll make it up in people going to the ballpark to watch him you'll make it up in the amount of jersey sales i mean shoot the entire country of japan will literally buy seattle mariner shohei otani jerseys because he's that big of a rock star over there so for me don't trade anybody for otani now because then you can make the argument later like dude you want to join this staff you're going to be our ace. And then our number two is Castillo, a guy who made the all-star game. Our number three is Kirby, a guy who also made the all-star game, right? When you look at, at hitters, you're you've going to have Julio still. Kelnick has made that, that jump up. You can make the argument like, oh, hey, Cal had a sophomore slump. Not a big deal. J.P. Crawford, he can be a leadoff guy. He can be a guy who's down in the lineup. Ty France, fantastic hitter. Hey, Hey, Eugenio had a bad year. We're not saying he's old yet, or maybe you bring in someone else for that position. Maybe you bring in, I mean, you have to bring in another second baseman, but yeah, I digress. It's, it's, at this point, it's just me going through position by position, which is not entertaining. <laughs> but what I am trying to say is keep these guys. You for can sure. trade other players, that younger farm system, to try and get someone that's going to help you immediately this year. And I totally think you should do that. I agree. You should still be a buyer but use and bide your time for Otani and then throw the kitchen sink at him full court press in the off season. Absolutely. No, yeah, I I couldn't imagine trading for him. I'm just curious if the angels, you know, because if Trout's out for another month, two months, the angels have no shot and they've wasted, you know, an entire span of having the two best players in all Mm -hmm. of baseball on their team and they've done nothing with it. Um, It's like, it, it makes sense for the angels to trade him because obviously they can restock restock their farm system. But um, yeah, it'll be crazy. There's uh, like 18 days left until the trade deadline. So mm-hmm. things are going to start getting pretty chaotic. Um, I've seen headlines that, you know, like the central divisions aren't too decided. So those teams mm-hmm. are kind of in a limbo to, you know, are we going to buy or sell? Um, but a couple teams that might be interesting for the Mariners are the White Sox and Cardinals. Um, I've kind of looked into, you know, there's a few different players on each of those teams that would be interesting. And then also kind of backing up. So Brian Wu, you know, this is his rookie season. Mm -hmm. He had Tommy John surgery in 2021 before he was drafted this. He's already 
past the most innings that he's pitched in a year in his entire career. And so he's going to be heavily limited at some point or even shut down. Um, I'm curious if they'll move into the move him to the bullpen um, on top of Marco Gonzalez being injured. And we don't know when he's going to be coming back from that. So it's like you, you now need a, a starting pitcher, at least one on top of the, the bat or two that you need. So that's where, you know, like the white Sox are interesting because you could go for Tim Anderson at a discount plus like a Giolito or potentially Lance Lynn. Um, mm-hmm. The big name is Luis Robert, but it sounds like the White Sox wouldn't trade him, and that would be a haul as well. Um, and then That, that yeah. would make sense to me. What uh, What are your thoughts on them pulling up pulling up the young kid? What is it, Emerson Hancock? Emerson Hancock? Why wouldn't they pull him up and give him the same kind of deal that they did with uh, Wu and Miller? Yeah, let me take a look at his stats. Um, the 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 thing about that is that you're relying on him to come up and produce right away, and that your playoff push and your potential postseason is dependent on, you know, him coming up and being the dude. Like Brian Wu has come rookie. up and, and been great. Um, mm-hmm. Currently in in triple or sorry double A, um, Emerson Hancock has a five point three ERA. He he's been struggling with the walks a bit. He's at four point two mm-hmm. walks per nine. Uh, he's at 10 strikeouts per nine, which is good. And he played in the Futures game last year, and he looked fantastic. Um, he had dealt with some shoulder injury and some other stuff the past couple of years, but he's been full health. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I expected Emerson Hancock to be up before Brian Wu, to be honest, uh, partially because of that pitch or innings restriction. But, um, yeah, I'd love to see em- Emerson Hancock, but it's like you need someone else to also be there as a stopgap. Yeah, try and hang on to him and see if you can go get someone for right now, I guess. Well, or I mean, shoot, maybe maybe you do let him go. Uh, the way Miller and Wu have looked, and Gilbert and Kirby. Yeah, it's just, yeah, with Wu. I mean, the talent is for sure there. It's just whether the front <laughs> office wants to, you know, risk Brian Wu for the sake of this this one year. Right. Or, well, and maybe you put him in the bullpen still, but right, yeah, uh, you go and sense. you trade away, you trade away Emerson, um, get, I mean, Lance Lynn, I, I'm not a huge Lance Lynn guy um, because I either feel like he dominates or he sucks. Like there's yeah. no in between, like you're either getting 12 K's dude is on fire, giving up like two hits, no runs, or it's a 12 spot. Um, right. And then there, I mean, also like, you know, not trying to look towards next year, but it's like uh, Robbie Ray would come back at some point. Exactly. So um, that could be something there too, where it's like maybe you just go get that loner, that one, that player for one year, and it's hey, we know this pitcher isn't going to stay with us, but maybe um, you know we can at least make a run at it, or maybe maybe it's you know Tim Anderson, and uh, hey, I know you're not going to stay with us next year. I don't know what his contract situation is, but we're going to take a swing at it. We're going to take a run. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, G Lito and Lance Lynn's contracts are up after this year. I think uh, Tim Anderson might have one or two more years after. Let me check. So, okay. So there's club options for this year, next year for Tim Anderson. So it's a club option next year for 14 million, uh, but he's had a down year. So you could buy him at a discount. Mm-hmm. And see, see if there's anything left in there. And then, uh, with the Cardinals, uh, there's been, you know, uh, news that had come out over the past year, I guess, that uh, Mariners and the Cardinals had been talking about exchanging, you know, like young arms for, from the Mariners for young controllable bats from the Cardinals. So looking at the Cardinals, there's guys like Brendan Donovan, Dylan Carlson, who are young and controllable. They're both, I believe, right around league average for bats right now, but at least you have the control there. And then you could piggyback on top of that, kind of similar with the White Sox, for a Jack Flaherty or a Mike Michaelis um, for the arm. And then I think it would be awesome if, if they were able to get Paul Goldschmidt out of it too. He's got one more year after this year. Mm-hmm. And he's, that would he's be a cool. MVP type bat. Yeah, plus, I mean, let's call a spade a spade. You guys have struggled. We have str- Well, they have struggled. Not us. We're not playing. Um, <laughs> But they have they have struggled hitting the ball this year. So 
uh, it might be a good idea to get that older veteran leadership, um, something that Carlos Santana provided for you last year. Now you're getting it to, you know, the umpth degree because you're getting a guy who MVP, you know, type candidate, the dude can hit. He's been raking for years. Well, let's get him in with some of these young guys. Let's uh, see what he can do um, and help you out in that way. I, I mean, if you get Goldschmidt, I think that shows a lot of people, hey, you're trying to win and you're trying to win now, which I think this team – well, I am excited about the future. I think that this is the start of winning. And sure. so there's, there isn't a reason to not trade away some of those like young farm system guys to win now because you already have the young guys in the MLB. Yeah. And realistically, you know, with these, when, when you start throwing in the Goldschmidt and these guys, um, another guy that would be really interesting would be Nolan Arenado. Because, um, I mean, he just signed a contract extension over the past couple of years, but he made it clear to the Rockies that he doesn't want to be on a, a rebuild team. And if the Cardinals are struggling and they're going to trade away a Paul Goldschmidt and some of these other guys and kind of enter into that phase, then um, I think he I think he, he was quoted the other week saying that he wouldn't, he wouldn't be surprised if he was traded. This is Arenado. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. Realistically, it would take, you know, like a Bryce Miller or a Brian Wu. And it would make more sense to trade Brian Wu because he's on the in innings limit this year. The, the Cardinals mm -hmm. wouldn't need him this year, but they have him for the future and he looks amazing. So a lot of interesting routes. You might be able to get him at a discount too. Um, yeah. If, if he if he's going out there saying he wants out. I, I also saw some stuff with uh, Miles. Um, Nicholas. Mc Nicholas, yeah, there was okay. talk of maybe trying to go get him um, because Wu is on that that innings limit. Um, that there, there's a lot of different interesting ways the Mariners can go about it, um, and it's funny because I think if you were to ask me, right, you know, the before the last three series before the All Star break, I'm probably saying like you're not necessarily sellers but you're definitely looking for the next year. You're not, you know, it's one of those things like you were, you ended up being two years early instead of one. Yeah. Um, because I do like, like I've said, I like the build of where you're at, but now when you win three series in a row against the Rays, against the giants and against Houston, that then makes me feel like, Hey, you might be catching fire at the right time, or you might be getting hot. Let's go make that move. Let's go make the Castillo move this year. And I don't know if it's a guy like Miles. I would certainly love a guy like Nolan Arenado. Um, and, and I think that's going to be – I think it'll be interesting to see what DePoto does. But I do feel and I hope that the Mariners are going to go and be buyers. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, never easy throwing in the white towel, especially with – I mean, with how good of a lineup that we have, and, you know, you go get Teoscar Hernandez in the offseason. Colton Wong has been a shell of himself, but that was an exciting move even because you got rid of, you mm -hmm. know, Winker and Toro for him. It wasn't giving up a ton. Um, yeah. It's a bummer that that hasn't worked out because people yeah. forget now after the fact, you were excited about getting Colton for sure. Wong. Mariner fans are trying to act like, we didn't want him and we said – when that trade was announced, there were a lot of Mariner fans going, hey, I mean, it's not the guy necessarily our number one choice, but that's a pretty good number two. Um, so that's unfortunate. Just snake bitten at second base because now Adam Frazier is doing great. It's like yeah, I was going to say he goes off on the Orioles and Colton Wong was coming off of his best power year and now he's mm -hmm. just hit his first home run like halfway into the year. Brutal. Um, yeah. We'll be interesting to see. Yeah, we've got 18 days left. Um, moving back, we'll jump back into the draft again real quick. Just bounce back there. Teddy McGraw is a really interesting pick. He was uh, drafted in the fourth round. Sorry, third round draft uh, pick number 92. He's a uh, 6'3", 210 guy out of Wake Forest University. Um, prior to the season, he had a uh, elbow injury heading into 2023. But um, apparently... The Wake Forest baseball coach was stated saying that right-handed pitcher uh, Teddy McGraw is the steal of the draft and that 
um, if he was healthy, that he would have been right there with Paul Skeens had he remained wow. healthy. So just wanted to note on on him. Um, oh, yeah, that's fantastic. When you look, he usually tops out around 92, 95, uh, but he's gotten up as high as 98. Um, yeah. He's, uh, what, he's 2001 birth. Oh, and he's also, he, he had Tommy John in 2019. He, he's so, had two Tommy Johns now, yeah. It's a bit of a risk. That's a <laughs> little terrifying, but <laughs> that's that's the perfect guy to take that risk on because if he does hit, you know, look at what you could have. It's a little bit of the Jacob Jacob DeGrom. Um, if I'm the Texas Rangers, I make that trade or I make that signing, I make that offer nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten because – if he stays healthy or if he times up his healthy period when I need it most, he could be my ace that takes me to a World Series. Unfortunately, it didn't work out this year. But if you look at a guy like Teddy McGraw, who's to say his he can't stay healthy? Maybe he just had some uh, unlucky injuries early on. I take, take the risk. If he doesn't work out, so what? Like 20% of them work out anyways. Right. Take the risk. And, and Depoto said today that that's they're really good at finding pitching, and whether it's uh, you know designated for assignment guys or if it's uh, via trade, um, t- he said you know typically or right now he's getting the best bats, and then you know finding those uh, pitchers in unique ways, and this just happened to be one of those circumstances mm-hmm. to where um, taking a big risk, but if he could be a, a Paul Skeens in two years type thing, that that'd be amazing. Exactly. Fantastic. Might as well. Um, and then I just wanted to note on the on the Marlins uh, draft also, they they got two the two best high school pitchers in the draft, and actually their second pick, which was in the second round, uh, Thomas White, he was a guy yeah. that I was kind of hoping that the Mariners would have picked with one of those second two picks just because of he he's like. I forget his height. He might be 6'5", 210 as a 18 year old throwing 96 from the left side. Uh, e- easy motion. And you got six Noble five, two ten. Yeah, you got Noble Meyer, who obviously was the number one high schooler coming out of it. They got him, I, I believe it was pick number ten or twelve. Um Yeah, local kid. Yep. So I think that the Marlins will have one of the best rotations in all of baseball for the next five plus years. Because now you have Sandy Alcantara as your ace. You got Jesus Luzardo, Edward Cabrera, Yuri Perez, uh, Max Meyer, Sixto, Sixto Sanchez, Trevor Rogers are different guys. Some of those are injured. And then now you have Noble Meyer and Thomas White. It's just, I, I was amazed that, that the league let the Marlins get both of those guys. So, yeah, no kidding. Well, and the thing with uh, Meyer is, He's only going to get stronger, and he's throwing 97. He's topped out at 100. Which is absolutely insane. He's <laughs> only going to get stronger. He's only going to get faster. I mean, you can you can look at the picture of him right now. That's not a grown man. Right. That's a kid. Yeah. And so if a kid is throwing 97, 98, I can only imagine what he's going to be throwing when he's – 20 21 22 actually gets into a program where he's lifting where he's eating where he is talking with pitching coaches not just your local high school pitching coach which again there's nothing wrong with that and like you said there are a lot of pitching coaches that are getting better every single day but now you're working with an mlb pitching coach that that's going to be fun to watch and then it's going to be fun to watch what he develops on on uh, the outside because they love his slider right now that's only going to get better as you pick up speed in your other pitches, but also as you get used to throwing the pitch, how do you keep each pitch so that they look the same? How do you get your arm slot? So everything looks the same. He's only going to improve. That kid is going to be scary if he can stay healthy. I mean, that's basically, you know, a a second coming of DeGrom is is what he could be. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. And he's, he's going to put on more weight. Six, five, one eighty five. He's skin and bones. That kid's gonna put on weight, but he's gonna put on good weight because it'll give be him some protein a, shakes. MLB and... nutrition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. No more muscle milk. Like we're putting you on the real stuff now. <laughs> Whole milk. Putting you on the mass gainer. Yeah. Goodness yeah. gracious. 
Awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, other than, you know, going through the entire, it would take a, a while and probably be pretty boring just going through every draft pick and saying all their stats, but, um, yeah, you just have to trust in the Mariners, you know, system and who they, th their front office with finding talent and drafting and, um, yeah, really excited to see. And with everyone else in the league, um, to see what the next wave looks like. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's a bummer that we're going to have to wait two, three years, but I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, let's see what, what else we got. Any other things top of mind? Um, let's see, uh, draft, uh, uh, right now, um, cause I can't look at that little note. Otherwise I would, um, let's see what we talked. Uh, I mean, the Reds, they've had their big, huge run. I know we talked about Ellie, but I mean, they went from, they literally went from worst to first in the month of June. They went from absolutely atrocious. These guys suck. And now you have Ellie De La Cruz and he's electrifying and he is seeing, I wouldn't say single-handedly, but pretty much he's turned your ball club around. And you How also crazy have, is yeah. That? And you also have, you know, Joey Votto's back. Drake, Jake Freely, another ex-Mariner guy. Yeah. It just comes out of nowhere and decides to leave the Mariners and rake. Dude's um, absolutely figuring it out. It's like, of course. Well, and the, the part that's crazy is that, that Lodolo is one of your better pitchers, and, and you don't have him. Like, he's out. He's hurt. So right. It, also, it shows Hunter Green funny. is on the IL 15-day IL, apparently. Yeah, he missed some time. You literally went from worst to first in such a short amount of time. Um, and I know it's, it's baseball. Like, one player doesn't make that big of a difference. This isn't the NBA. Like, you don't make the trade for LeBron, and now all of a sudden you're a title contender, right? That's not how baseball works. Yeah. But to see this young kid come into your ball club and immediately start some kind of momentum shift. Now, it could be a little bit of Ellie and Joey. You have your star who comes back from his injuries, and he's raking. You got a guy like Fraley who's, you know, he's making a step up. But it just seems like Ellie De La Cruz is the catalyst because the minute – he gets on base, anything can happen. And then when he's in the field, he can make all the throws. He can make all the plays. It almost seems like his confidence and his ability has transferred to the other players, and they're not even at full strength. Are they going to win a World Series this year? Probably not. But they're exciting, and they're young. And it's showing everybody what biding your time and what waiting and making sure you hit on that right guy can be. The Mariners have it in Julio. Seems like the Reds have it tenfold in Ellie. Yeah, and in his first 30 games, 138, uh, 135 plate appearances, he's batting a 325, 363 on-base percentage, a 524 slugging, which is an OPS of 887. So he's OPSing about 31% better than the, the league average in his first 30 mm -hmm. games, on top of 16 stolen bases. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> the crazy. The dude might end up having 30 to 40 stolen bases. Yeah. insane if he if he would have played the whole year he probably is a 2020 guy for sure absolutely as a as a rookie you know he's probably not gonna get there he only has four home runs right now right the, the thing i don't love is the amount of times he strikes out he's at 39 in 39 30. to just eight walks that's yeah. a lot but at the same time if you're gonna strike out 39 times but your average is going to be 325. I think I can look the other way. Is this an anomaly where the strikeouts are just more because he's young or is the average, the anomaly? Cause you feel like one of those is going to come back to where it probably should it, you know, there's a reason why most people are, Hey, you strike out this many times, your average about this, but I mean, shoot at the same time, the way it's almost a Yasiel Puig like when he came up as a rookie where he is just so electrifying and so much fun that the team starts winning because of him in some way. It's very, it, it's exciting. It's cool. Yeah. And just to speak on uh, his approach at the plate again, real quick. So in the minor leagues, he was actually known for having a pretty solid eye. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in AAA this year, he had 26 walks in, 
186 plate appearances. He had a on base percentage before he got the call of 398. So he's going to on base at like a 400 percent or 400. Um, yeah, which is ridiculous. Clip. That's right. great. Well, I mean, even right now is on base percentage. He's 363. Yeah. Like, dude, <laughs> that's a great clip. And then you factor in his speed. And with the new rules, it only makes it easier to steal bases. He He's at a spot where I'll be interested to see if in the second half, if anything changes or if anything cools off. Because what do they always say? You know, uh, rookie quarterback in the NFL, and I know it's apples to oranges a little bit, but you – truly see how great they are after that like fourth or fifth start because that's when everyone has film on you the league will adjust what is what is ellie yeah. going to be like once the league adjusts and how do you tinker with the new rules to slow him down on the base pass or even can you that's the kind of stuff that i can't wait to see in the second half and for me that's a storyline that the mlb should be pumping up like i already know he's in like the gatorade commercials but we always talk about the MLB is so regional. You care about your region, care about your region. He's someone you need to bump him up. He needs to be on ESPN. I need to see tweets about him because he can go from a regional star to a national star like that. And if he right. does that, all of a sudden people are paying attention to games in Cincinnati that before you were never, you weren't going to care about. You weren't going to pay attention to. If you can get me in Washington to get on the MLB app and watch a Cincinnati game at four, you've won. So how do you market him? How do you use him? And can he stay hot enough that they're going to want to market him in that way? And right now the Reds are in first place in the NL Central. They're a game ahead of mm-hmm. Milwaukee. The next closest is the Cubs, which are seven games back of the Reds. So if they if they keep this up, I mean, yeah, they'll be in the playoffs. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. And, and that's what you that's all you can ask for. The biggest tragedy right now in the MLB is that Mike Trout hasn't been in the playoffs in years. He's your most – I mean, he's not your he's, most marketable star. I'm but pretty he's sure he's player. never been in – I don't think he's ever been in the playoffs. I thought he got one. I thought he got one, like, early, early in his career. Maybe I'm wrong. I think you're wrong, but, too. Let me see. I, oh, know, yeah. That, I think it might have been a while. Let me see. Yeah. It was like that rookie year. 2014. Mm-hmm. in uh yeah 2014 083 batting average in the postseason one home run which is brutal because i mean that's that's young mike trout that's he has that's his third full season up fourth full season up or second full season up that's not mike trout and that's what baseball is killing itself on is your best players aren't getting there shohei we've never seen shohei in the postseason There's nothing better for baseball than Julio, Shohei, Adley, Ellie now, Mike Trout. These guys need to be in the postseason. You paid attention to the Phillies. I mean, you're a baseball guy. But casual fans, everyone knows who Bryce Harper is. You paid attention to the Phillies because what a crazy run, underdog story, and they have Bryce Harper. Every single sports fan knows who Bryce Harper is and how electrifying he can be. So – if I'm the MLB, obviously you're not setting stuff up, but you're pumping guys out like Ellie and you're really marketing them to try and get them that notoriety. So when they do make the postseason, those casual fans who tune in, you know, in October, in November to see who wins the World Series. Oh, hey, I know who Ellie De La Cruz is. I've seen him in that Nike commercial or I've seen him in that Gatorade commercial. For sure. And uh, one other idea um, so thinking back to, to the World Baseball Classic, you know, that moment between Shohei Otani and Mike Trout going against each other. I heard the idea mm-hmm. of making the all-star game world versus U.S. And so that, that you know, was... instead of having to wait for the WBC, it's like the all-star game is world mm-hmm. versus U.S. It's just another way for everyone to get, just get more amped up about that game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that would be interesting. Nice and, I, and I don't hate that. I know. I know the World Baseball Classic really got its start because they took baseball out of the Olympics. Um, I'd be I'd be interested to see how that works because even with you know baseball being back, added back into the Olympics, the MLB doesn't take that break like the NHL does. So you don't get to see the true stars um, in the Olympics when people would watch and would watch a lot. Um, so that, I think that's an interesting 
little way to do it. I know like uh, at the Moto Center, they do USA versus the world for the 18U team or the 18U players, uh, the high school players getting ready uh, to go to college. I'd be interested to see if that would work and how that would work. Maybe that would drum up some more interest. Um, but at the same time, I mean, the MLB All-Star Game, yeah, it's the lowest viewed All-Star Game the MLB has ever had. You still pulled in 7 million viewers. That's more than any other All-Star Game or Pro Bowl in the NFL. That's something to um, definitely hang your hat on. And you want to tweak it a little bit, but not too much to the point where you lose guys like me, uh, guys like you from wanting to tune in. For sure. Yeah, it's going to be a, a really exciting second half of baseball. Um, a lot of fun teams. You know, the, the Diamondbacks came out of nowhere you, as we were talking about the Reds. Um, let's see what other teams. The Rangers are there. The AL West is going to be tough. Um, the AL Central, they're all very mediocre. They're all the, the division leader right now in the AL Centrals at 500. And then the Rays and the Orioles are, are other teams that are surprising people. So. Yeah, the central well, and the Rays are finding a way to fall off right now, three and seven in their last ten. Right. Um, but the both centrals are hot garbo, uh, <laughs> which is kind of why the Reds were able to make their uh, their comeback there. Um, but as as a Mariner fan, I'm I'm paying a lot of attention to the AL East because that's where the teams ahead of you are. Boston's ahead of you, New York's ahead of you, Toronto's ahead of you, um, and Baltimore's ahead of you. Those are the teams ahead of you in the wild card race right now. And I think Houston, right? So if I'm Mariner fans, I'm kind of hoping that AL East cannibalizes itself because they're going to have to play against each other. You know, can you get New York to go and fall off with uh, Aaron judge being out? And you've seen a little bit, but can they keep that slide going? Will Boston get to a point where they go, eh, you know, this isn't the year we're going to pack it in. As a Mariner fan, yes, I'm paying attention to my Mariners, but at 4 o'clock, I'm checking the scoreboard or I might be tuning in to some of these AL East games and praying for some downfalls. For sure. Yeah, and um, yeah, every AL East team is ahead of the Mariners, which is insane. The AL East is just, I mean, it's let's take a look so at strong. it. Yeah, the last so place strong. is has a 527 average. Which, yeah. Man. Uh, yeah, that's way, Boston's way. Boston's at 48 and 43. New York's 49, 42. Uh, Toronto, 50, 41. And Baltimore, 54 and 35. Crazy. Yeah. But right now you're two, you're two games back of Boston. If you can take two out of three from Detroit, you should. I mean, shoot, if you could sweep them, that'd be best. But if you can take two out of three, you're going to get at least one game back. Right, you're gonna get uh, hopefully another game back or two against New York. So, um, really, fingers crossed that they cannibalize. Really, a bummer now that they uh, they took away that series against that extra series against your divisional opponents. Yeah. So yeah. So now you know. Yeah. Now it won't have as big of an impact with the ALEs cannibalizing versus prior years because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of uh, of the the Blue Jays. Um, so the Mariners start their, uh, second half of the season tomorrow, um, against the, the Tigers and they have a 10 game homestand. They got three against the Tigers, four against the, the twins, and then the blue Jays come to town for three. So next weekend will be a, a huge series to watch against the blue Jays in Seattle. So, yep. Need to keep winning, uh, games and series against teams ahead of you. Uh, super Einsteinian theory there by me. Yeah, right. You gotta you gotta win games to you gotta win more games to do better. You gotta gotta win more games and you'll get more prizes. Who would have thought? <laughs> Usually the team with the most runs scored in the game will win. If you ain't first, you're last. <laughs> well, uh Will, I, I really appreciate your time. It's been fun. We'll uh definitely have you on again as a regular um on the show. So I, I appreciate it, all your input. Um look forward to the next time dude thank you uh thank you for having me uh, i love giving our uh, little baseball chats i always learn something from you and love the couch gm make sure everyone goes and subscribes and you can find me on 1080 so hope you guys tune in um again dude can't 
can uh, say enough good things about you, Connor. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, appreciate that. All right, we'll see you. All right, see you, buddy.